for several years, I have been concerned about increasing racism and the church's adoption of a worldly philosophy in regards to how we view race. In other words, over the past couple of years, I have been very concerned, not only with what seems to be an increasing racism uh, across the country, but the way in which we as a church, broadly speaking, Christians all across the nation, have decided to address racism. I think it was in my college years that I first became aware of this issue and first through various sermons I had listened to, through various conversations I had heard, where there seemed to be a popular diminishing of white people. Where I would hear things like, oh, white people this or white people that. Now, I know I'm very not melanin driven, right? My, my mom is Navajo, my dad is Mexican, and, and there is some Anglo in me, and it really shows on my skin color, right? But I was not particularly offended by that. I, I, I wasn't. But it just happened again and again, all of these um, knocking of white people. And I noticed that there tended to be this language of whiteness, oppression by whiteness. Fast forward to a couple of years, and Ethan and I are up in Reno, Nevada, and we're at an Acts 29 conference, and one of the preachers, his name is Eric Mason, is preaching about racial equality. And he starts off his sermon strong. He talks about how justice is the church's responsibility, and justice is what Christians should be manifesting. And he made the statement that the world has stolen justice from us, and they've adopted it to their own ends. And I was all about it. I was with him entirely. And then Mason went off course. And what I noticed that he started to do was he started to blend implications and outworkings of the gospel, namely justice, with the gospel itself. In other words, the gospel is the, is the good news that though we are condemned, though we're sinners, on our way to hell, Jesus came, he died on the cross in our place. If we put our trust in him, we will be saved. That is the gospel. And what I noticed with Mason is he tended to make implications of the gospel, the outliving, the outworking of the gospel, part of the gospel message itself. A couple of months later, I found myself in Georgia attending the NAM, the North American Mission Board orientation. And here again, I heard them tell us that part of the gospel work is res restoration of racial communities. That is part of the gospel message. I was having lunch one time with a pastor at a, at a church here in our town. And another pastor came up to us and informed us that his church had just spent thousands of dollars from a, someone to come to the church, an advisor, to evaluate how they're doing in regards to diversity and in, in regards to racial reconciliation. And I don't want to name this church because you would know it, but I will give you a hint. It's one of the biggest churches in our town. And he asked us, so we're struggling with racial reconciliation. We're struggling with diversity. How are you guys pursuing diversity? And the pastor, I was eating lunch with, we just looked at each other like, what's this, what's this guy talking about? I, I don't have a, a box to fit in what he's, what he's saying. And of course, last summer, all of us saw cities burn to the ground over Black Lives Matter riots in the streets. So what we're going to do today is we're going to address the issue of racism. What does the Bible teach concerning race? And here's, here's the flow of our development th this morning. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to see worldly understandings of racism. In other words, what is the world saying about racism? And what is the world saying how to fix racism? 
Next, we'll see point two, what the Bible says about racism. How does the Bible tell us to address racism? And how does the Bible tell us to reconcile races? Finally, we're going to see in, in our third point this morning, the Bible's celebration of ethnicity. So let's first consider worldly understandings of racism. What is our world right now saying about racism? When, when you hear that word racist, several things may enter your mind. You may think, for example, about slavery, about children being, being separated from their parents, about blacks being cruelly overworked in a field, about white southern masters whipping them and beating them until they're bloody and deformed. You may think about the horror of someone treating another person as property. You may think about segregation, separate schools, separate drinking fountains, separate bathrooms. Black people sit here, white people sit here on the bus. You may think about lynching and the KKK and Martin Luther King being assassinated. You may think about the Los Angeles race riots in the 90s. You may think about what, what is more near and dear to us here in San Juan County in the 70s where we had Navajo people who were murdered by, teen, by white teenagers. And you can read about that in a book called The Broken Circle where they tortured these Navajos to death simply because of the race. We think of Farmington as this conservative bastion, but yet in those days, there, I, I don't know if you were around for this. I wasn't. I just read about it. There was actually a riot, I guess, in, in downtown Farmington. And of course, all of us watched on the news and on social media of cities on fire this summer as Black Lives Matter hit the streets. And, and these are all historical events. What exactly is racism, however? Is racism prejudice? Is it discrimination? Is it, is it hatred? Well, here's how the new Oxford American Dictionary defines it. Defines racism this way. Prejudice, discrimination, antagonism directed against a person or people on the basis of their membership in a particular racial or ethnic group, typically one that is a minority or marginalized. The dictionary then goes on to further define racism this way. The belief that different races possess distinct characteristics, abilities, qualities, especially so as to distinguish them as inferior or superior to one another. And I think we would all agree with that understanding of what it means to be racist. It means to be prejudiced. It, mean, it means to discriminate against other people. It means to be antagonistic, to be hateful towards a people group simply because of the color of their skin or of their culture. We, we, we understand that. But what shocks us, I think, or at least is what, what is causing many of us to be confused right now, is when we hear things like white privilege or systemic racism or whiteness. And, and you say, where did this come about? Where did it come about now where, where we believe that racism is discrimination or prejudice, but now I'm being told by people that I'm a racist simply because of the color of my skin. I may have never had a racist thought in my life. I may never have had a racist in, in, intention before, but I'm being called racist because maybe you're white. Well, these terms, systemic racism, white privilege, whiteness, these terms and the reasoning behind them comes from activist scholarship known as critical race theory. And critical race theory is notoriously difficult to define. So I'm going to rely on an explanation by Richard Delgado and Jean Stefanik, Stefanik to define critical race theory for us. And you say, well, why are you relying on them to define critical race theory? The reason why I'm relying on them is because they have written the textbook on critical race theory. So I did some research and I found that in college campuses, in diversity courses, this is the book, this is the textbook that they're reading to introduce people to critical race theory. So I'm not, I'm not, what, I'm, what I'm doing this morning is I'm not telling you what other people say 
about critical race theory. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying, well, this critic of critical, critical race theory is saying this about critical race theory. What we're doing, and I want you to stick with me, because it's really important. What we're doing is we're seeing what critical race theorists themselves say about their position. It's really important if we're going to evaluate someone's position that we accurately relay what they actually believe. So, so what we're going to do is we're just going to, we're going to quote directly from them. Here's how they describe it. Critical race, the critical race theory, abbreviated CRT, movement, is a collection of activists and scholars engaged in studying and transforming the relationship among race, racism, and power. The movement considers many of the same issues that conventional civil rights and ethics studies discloses, takes up, but places them in broader perspective that in, includes economics, history, setting, group, self-interest, emotions, and the unconscious. Unlike traditional civil rights discourse, which stresses incrementalism and step-by-step -step process, critical race theory questions the very foundation of the liberal order, including equality theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment rationalism, and neutral principles of constitutional law. And you say, what on earth are they talking about? Well, they're going to go on and give us six tenets of critical race theory. What they mean by that. Here's number one. First, racism is ordinary, not aberrational. The usual way society does business, the common everyday experience of most people of color in this country. Racism is difficult to address or cure because it is not acknowledged. That's the first tenet. Tenet two. The second feature, sometimes called interest convergence or material determinism, adds a further dimension. Because racism advances the interests of both white elites and working class elites, large segments of society have little incentive to eradicate it. Thirdly, a third theme of critical race theory, the social construction thesis, holds that the race and races, races are product of social thought and relations. Not objective, inherent, or fixed, they correspond to no biological or genetic reality. Rather, races are categories that society invents, manipulates, or retires when convenient. And at that point, we are going to agree wholeheartedly with critical race theory. At point number three, that race is a social construct, and, and we'll see that in a moment. The fourth tenet of critical race theory is this. Another somewhat more recent development concerns racialization and its consequences. Critical writers in law as well as social science have drawn attention to the ways dominant society racializes different minority groups at different times in response to shifting needs such as the labor market. Fifthly, closely related to different racialization is the idea that each race has its own origins and evolving history, is the notion of intersectionality and anti-essentialism. No person has a single, easily stated, unitary identity. Everyone has potentially conflicting, overlapping identities, loyalties, and allegiances. Sixth, a final element concerns the notion of the unique voice of color. Coexisting in somewhat easy tension with anti-essentialism, the voice of color thesis holds that because of their different histories and experiences with oppression, black, American Indian, Asian, and Latino writers and thinkers may be able to communicate to their white counterparts matters that the whites are unlikely to know. Minority status, in other words brings with it a presumed competence to speak about race and racism. And so, if I'm understanding them correctly, here are those six points in, in my words. I'm, 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 synop I'm uh, synthesizing it for you, simplifying it for you. If I'm understanding them correctly, here, here are their six points here. Number one, six tenets of critical race theory. Number one, racism is normal and it's unacknowledged by whites. 
Number two, racism benefits whites, so whites have no reason to end it. Number three, races are social constructs. Number four, minorities are racialized for the dominant culture's purpose. In other words, whites racialize uh, minorities to use minorities for their own end. Number five, intersectionality. It's the belief that people have overlapping loyalties and overlapping points of victimhood. So think of it like an intersection. When you cross an intersection, you could get hit by a car. Intersectionality is the idea is if you're a woman, you're, you're a victim in our culture. If you're black, you're a victim in our culture. If you're a lesbian, you are a victim in our culture. So those are three points of intersectionality where you can potentially be victimized. That's the idea. Number six, minorities have special experiential voice to speak to things that whites cannot understand. So if I'm understanding Delgado and Stefanik correctly, this is what they are saying that critical race theory is. Now, these academic tenets of critical race theory aren't just contained to the campuses of universities or among peer-reviewed journals. One of the most influential proponents of critical theory at a popular level comes from Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility. And I'm sure you have heard of this book because in the wake of the killing of George Floyd, this book has been everywhere. I've seen it on Facebook. I've seen it on Twitter. I've seen it Christians promoting this book. I've heard churches reading this book in Bible studies. White Fragility is everywhere. And in this book, D'Angelo expresses three points that are relevant for our consideration this morning. So she says, obviously, more than three points, but I read the book. There are three, three ideas that are relevant for our purpose this morning. Here they are. Number one, according to D'Angelo, racism, and this is really important for us, racism is not individual action or attitude, but systems of oppressive power. Those systems specifically are economic, legal, and political. And listen to what Delgado or D'Angelo says here. She says, Racism is deeply embedded in the fabric of our society. It is not limited to a single act or person, nor does it move back and forth one day benefiting whites and another day or era benefiting people of color. The direction of power between white people and the people of color is historic, traditional, and normalized in ideology. Racism differs from individual racial prejudice and racial discrimination and the historical acclimation and ongoing use of institutional power and authority to support the prejudice and to systemically enforce discriminatory behaviors with far-reaching effects. Now what D'Angelo is saying there is this. Racism is not prejudice. It is not you hating another person. Racism is the oppression of minorities, of people of color, by those who are in power. That's what she's saying. Number two, because whites are the predominant people in these systems, they benefit most from these systems of power. Therefore, to be white is to be racist. This is what she says. Individuals, whites, may be against racism, but they still benefit from a system that privileges whites as a group. David Wellam succinctly summarizes racism as a system of advantage based on race. These advantages are referred to as white privilege. Sociological concept referring to advantages that are taken for granted by whites that cannot similar, similarly enjoyed by people of color in the same context. So here's what D'Angelo is saying. If you are white, you are a racist. You are. You may never have had a racist thought. You may have never hated another person of color. But if you are white, you are racist. And the reason why you are racist is because you are the majority culture in our country and you benefit from the systems of power like the police, like the schools, 
like the churches, like the government, that oppresses minorities. That's called white privilege. So, doesn't matter what you believe, doesn't matter what you think, doesn't matter how you act. If you're white, you're racist. The third thing that she says is that whites are offended at accusations of their being racist when they feel that they are not racist. And she calls this white fragility. She says, we consider a challenge to our racial worldview. Oh, oh, excuse me, before we get there. So not only if you're white, you're racist, this is really important. If you're a minority, Mexican, black, Asian, whatever, if your skin is not white, you cannot be racist, she says. People of color may also hold prejudices and discriminate against white people, but they lack the social institutional power that transforms their prejudice and discrimination into racism. If you're white, you're racist. Doesn't matter what you do, what you think, what you feel, how you act. You're white, you benefit from white privilege, you are racist. If you're black and you hate whites, that's not racism. It's not. Then she says this, because obviously I can read some of your faces, if you whiteies in here, you're offended at this. And she says, well, this is just a display of your white fragility. When we consider a challenge to our racial worldview, a challenge to our very identities as good moral people, thus we perceive any attempt to connect us to the racism, to the, the system of racism as an unsettling and unfair moral offense. The small, smallest amount of racial stress is intolerable. The mere suggestion that being white has meaning that often triggers a range of defensive responses. These include emotions as ang- such as anger, fear, guilt, behaviors such as argumentation, silence, withdrawal, stress-inducing situation. These responses work to reinstate white equilibrium as they repel the challenge, return our racial comfort, and maintain our dominance within racial hierarchy. I conceptualize this process as white fragility. So you tell people then that they are inherently racist because they're white. They get defensive about it. They say that they're not racist and you say, well, your defensiveness is proof that you are in fact racist and that you're fragile about it. Several times in her book, D'Angelo mentions how much white people do not like her trainings. And I find that hilarious. Accuse people of racism, they get mad, and you say, well, you're getting mad shows that you are, in fact, a racist. Like, how, how, do you, how do you respond to that? And it's not just on the college campus that critical race theory is advocated, nor is it only found at the shelves at Target with books like with, uh, White Fragility. Critical race theory with its view of racism and whiteness is coming to your workplace. Earlier this year, back in February, I think it was, I don't know if you remember, a Coca-Cola employee training leaked online. And the training was how to be less white. Well, how did Coca-Cola tell its employees to be less white? Here's how. Be less oppressive, be less arrogant, be less certain, be less defensive, be less ignorant, be more humble, listen, believe, break with apathy, break with with white solidarity. What that training then is saying is, to be white is to be oppressive. To be white is to be arrogant. To be white is to be certain. To be white is to be defensive. To be white is to be ignorant. I mean, that is critical race theory. That is exactly what that is. So I know what we've covered is a lot. But if we were to summarize all of that, we can conclude, generally speaking, that critical race theory is about the oppressed, who are minorities, and the oppressor, who are whites. To be white is to be privileged, and to be white is to be a racist, because racism is not your attitude, actions, or acts. It is a systemic. This understanding of racism, it's not just on college campuses. It's not just on, in books. It's not just at workplaces. It is coming to our schools. Earlier this week, on Wednesday, I received an email from our school district in Farmington. And that email said, we are not currently teaching critical race theory. Our district is not incorporated, but it is being discussed at the federal and state level. And in 2023, the New Mexico Public Education Department will be adopting new social studies standards. So if you don't want us to be teaching critical race theory in our schools, you need to let your voice be known 
is basically the gist of the email. And it will be interesting to see where we land. So we understand that, right? We understand that people who are not Christians, people who are not coming from a biblical worldview, are going to have crazy racist ideas about what it means to be racism, to be a racist. What's not expected, however, what is both surprising and tragic is that the ideology of what's being taught in critical race theory is being propagated by influential, well-known, and trusted Bible teachers. Colleges, stores, workplaces, schools, and now even churches are adopting critical race theory. And so what I want, you, what I want to do next is to expose us to some proponents of Christians, pastors, leaders, authors, teachers, who teach critical race theory. And you'll notice in the outline, this is woke Christianity, and you notice it's, uh, it's segmented under worldly understandings of racism because although these men and women are believers, are influential pastors and Christians and theologians, what they are propagating is worldliness. They're not getting this from the Bible, in other words. They are adapting critical race theory and attempting to wed it to Christianity. They are woke. To be woke is, to be, is the preferred term for those who are woke to be enlightened, to become awakened to the oppression of minorities in the country. So this first clip that we're going to watch is from Jarvis Williams. Williams is the Associate Professor of New Testament Interpretation at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. In this video, Williams echoes critical race theory's understanding of racism. And when we think about white supremacy, it's not only the overt, violent expressions that you see on the television in Charlottesville, for example, but white supremacy is an ideological construct that believes that whiteness is superior to non-whiteness. So then how this shows up in part is it shows up in curriculum right? Uh, I'm a seminary professor, and in theological education, it's, it's, you're hard-pressed to find many evangelical institutions that have a regular requirement of black and brown authors. And often what happens is whiteness becomes the standard by which all good theology is judged. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. So that if it's right theology, it's written by a white scholar, who is contextualizing that theology for white audiences. And so one of the things we see is, and hear this very, very carefully, there's racism by intent and there's racism by consequence. You can have racism operating in a context where is there are no individual racists. And that in part is the way in which white supremacy works in a socially sophisticated way. When you have whiteness as the priority, and when folks work and operate in such a way with curriculum, with economics, or with policies to maintain and to posture and to privilege that whiteness, and then to require those who are non-white to, cultural, to culturally colonize to whiteness. So then we think about reconciliation and ethnic hostility. The solution is not more black and brown faces in white spaces who colonize to whiteness. The solution is fundamentally, yes, the gospel, the cross, the resurrection, right? The blood of Jesus, but also dethroning white supremacy in all of the forms in which it shows up in Christian spaces, folks. Because when Jesus died to disarm those principalities and powers, one of those principalities and powers, I would argue, is white supremacy and all that it entails. So, so feel that tonight. White supremacy is not just violence or KKK or lynchings. It is also the belief, directly or indirectly, that whiteness is rightness. And everything has to be judged by that. 
So did you, did you catch what he's doing there? He's using those same terminology that we, we saw in critical race theory. He's saying that, that the criteria in theological education in our day is whiteness. And, and I have to be honest with you, I was shocked when I saw that video because I had no idea what he was talking about. When I read theology and, and when I look at commentaries or books on theology, I don't look at the back and see what the color is of the person. That's not a criteria. I don't ask if this is a man or a woman, black or white. I I, I don't care because our criteria is not, are they black? Our criteria is, are they faithful to scripture? And I I don't know what he's talking about. I went to seminary. I read the North African fathers, men like Augustine, who was arguably the most influential figure in all of Christian history, came from North Africa. Clement, Origen, Tertullian, Athanasius, all of them North African. The school I went to, Dr. Mark Sidwell, who taught me history of Christianity and historical theology, authored a book called Free Indeed, Heroes of Black Christianity. And I know if we're doing that at Bob Jones University, seminaries across this country are doing that. But there's a bigger problem here, and it's what I already mentioned, where, where Williams, Jarvis Williams, is looking at everything through the lens of race, specifically through the lens of critical race theory. This next clip that I want you to see comes from Matt Chandler. Matt Chandler is the lead pastor of the Village Church, a huge church in Texas. He's an accomplished author and well-known preacher, having regularly preached at both the Gospel Coalition and Together for the Gospel Conferences. He even served for a long time as the president of Acts 29. So growing up, um, here's what that looked like for me. Um, when I sat in school growing up and learned about the history of the United States of America, I, I opened up our books, I had to write reports. Uh, I saw in those books and read the stories of and wrote reports on people who looked like me. And then when I turned on the television, uh, by and large, at any moment in time, when I turned on the television, what I saw was people who looked like me. Uh, and then when I got magazines or when I got books or when I played with toys or what, what I saw repeatedly were people that that looked like me. At almost any given moment, I was surrounded by people who looked almost just like me. And so really, the the entire experience uh, of my life has been one of, I, I can easily find people that look like me. Almost all my understanding of what made America great is because of efforts and, and the work ethic of people like me. And I'm, I come from a, a, a lower class, um, Anglo family, and and so my story is kind of the American dream, pulled myself up by my bootstraps, right? Worked hard, learned to work hard from my daddy, um, yada, 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 right? I I could go on and on there. But but what happens in in that kind of upbringing, which, which is fine, is that there were some lenses put over my eyes in, in which I saw the world through those lenses, um, not knowing what those lenses are. And, and so if I could kind of just be straight at what I'm talking about is, is that I, I have grown up with this invisible kind of bag of privilege, this kind of invisible toolkit that, that I can reach in there at any given moment and, and have um, this type of privilege that a lot of other brothers and sisters don't have, don't possess. And, and so what happens when you have my upbringing and even my current reality, Um, is that you're forced to, if you're not careful, if you don't let the gospel kind of purify your heart, if you don't lean on the word of God to shape your understandings, uh, you, you begin to judge harshly those who, who can't quite get to where you are and you will begin to see that getting people to where you are is what's normative. And so if I could just kind of lay it all out there, what I'm talking about right now is white privilege. And so I listen, I and I know some of you are already reaching to kind of click out. Nothing makes Anglos more angry than the idea of white privilege. But let's just talk for a second. If you'll give me just, just a second. Um, so white privilege isn't overt racism, right? Instead, it's just this unique kind of experience of life in predominant culture. So again, let, let's go back and talk about it. Growing up, 
throughout your history books, if you learned anything other than white people built and made America great white, it was during the month of February, it was condensed, and it was kind of an, a millimeter of depth of really what other kind of ethnicities contributed to what's now modern day uh, America. And, and even if you are, and then when you open up your newspaper or you grab a magazine, you're gonna see Anglos portrayed mostly in a positive sense, right? Um, if you go to buy your kids toys or go to buy them a little book, it's gonna be pretty easy to just find kids that look like them on the cover. So we don't know what it's like to have to look around Barnes and Nobles for 15 minutes trying to find a book about a little girl growing up that looks like our little girl or like a little boy growing up that looks like our little boy. Like we've never had to struggle with that. We we don't get anxious every time we open up a newspaper about how we'll be portrayed. We, we don't, th these, are, these are aspects of, it's an invisible air that we breathe, the type of lens that we wear. So what happens is when things blow up, we can look at African Americans or Asians or um, Hispanics and, and because of the lenses in which we we wear and how we've been shaped by this invisible force, we tend to expect, why can't they just? Why won't they? And what we're saying in that moment is we're harshly judging and we're expecting, if they would just look like us, if they would just do what we've done, then, then none of this would happen. And it's a really kind of terrible judgmental place to sit. And so what we want is we want the truth of God's word and the beauty of the gospel to wash over us. We don't need to feel bad uh, about our experience in the predominant culture. We just need to be aware of it so it doesn't shape how we interact with the world around us. We know that when all said and done, there are sons of Adam and sons of God. Right? There are those who have sinned and are outside the covenant promises, and there are those that have been bought by the blood of Christ and are inside the covenant promises. So that when all said and done, there's the race of Adam and the race of Christ, and we're gonna identify with the race of Christ regardless of skin color. And so what we want is we wanna live in such a way that shows that we understand that God has brought together in Christ men and women for every tribe, tongue, and nation on earth, every ethnicity, every language, every culture, and has created a new culture of mutual submission and joy in the differences found in one another as it rounds us out more as the people of God. So I, I like Matt Chandler a lot. I benefited from him. I, I met him one time, and he was legitimately one of the nicest people I've ever met. He was caring, and he was interested in my ministry. I see this guy in the airport. You're Matt Chandler. Hey, he looks at me. You're going to get together for the gospel. I am. Well, tell me about yourself. Where do you pastor? Legitimately, one of the nicest guys I've ever met. And it grieves me to see him talking this way. But notice the subtlety and the vague generalities of what Chandler says in that clip. He, he is using the language of critical race theory and he's not, he's not letting you in on the fact that he's influenced by critical race theory. It's very soft-spoken. It's very subtle. And I want, in, in a few moments, we're going to biblically analyze this and, I want, and, and we will see that the way that Chandler talks about white privilege is not helpful, nor is it a biblical perspective on race. The final clip that I want to show you comes from David Platt. Like Chandler, David Platt is a well-known preacher and author. Like Chandler, he preached at Together for the Gospel. He served as the president of the Southern Baptist Convention's Missionary Agency, the International Mission Board, and this is what Platt says. I want to sacrifice more of my preferences as a white pastor. I need to grow in my laying aside of preferences for members of this body because I want Christ to be exalted through increasing diversity in our leadership and our membership. On a related note, I, I do not want to speak from the Bible on issues that are popular among white followers of Christ while staying silent in the Bible on issues that are important to non-white followers of Christ. That's not faithful pastoring. I actually read this week how studies have shown that white church leaders are less likely to speak and act prophetically on race issues because white church leaders have more to lose when they do. Basically, if you want to draw a crowd in general, stay away from racial issues. And if you want to draw a crowd of white people or, or black people or this type of person or that type of person, then stay away from saying any one of those types of people is part of the problem on racial issues. 
Because the reality is many people mainly want to be comforted when they come to church. And as people, we're, we're naturally drawn to that which brings the most benefit, most benefit with the least cost. So if you give people a choice between the church of comfort and the church of comfort, but you need to make sacrifices to change your life, people will choose the church of comfort most every time. Which is why we've designed so much of the church culture the way we have today. And it's why we're so prone not to talk about issues that are uncomfortable to us. And I just want us to see that the Bible doesn't give us that option. Like Amos 5 doesn't give us that option. We cannot truly worship God while we stay silent on injustice in all kinds of areas. And I know as a white pastor, I have blind spots. So I am part of the problem. I need friends and fellow pastors around me from different ethnicities who help me see those blind spots. And I'm, I'm committed to listening and learning and loving, laying aside whatever contemporary church growth methodology says is the best way to grow the church, i.e. ignore the issues. I want us to do the exact opposite. I want us to hear God's word clearly on these issues and then we can trust him with the growth of his church. So the key, the key phrase there is Platt talks about how as a white pastor, he has blind spots and as a white pastor, he is part of the problem. And he goes on to say that he needs people of color to speak into his life to correct him. And what Platt is doing there is he is undermining the authority of Scripture. Because he's saying, Scripture is not enough. I can't arrive at these conclusions of how to treat people from Scripture. I need, as a white person, I need other people to speak into my life because I don't see it. And thus, Scripture is undermined. Critical race theory and its cheap imitation woke Christianity are already negatively affecting our culture. This is such the case that even, even liberal scholars are warning us of the danger of embracing critical race theory. Liberal political writer Helen Pluckrose, an atheist, James Lindsay, not a Christian, an atheist, evaluate critical race theory in their book, Cynical Theories, and here is what they say. Some studies have already shown that diversity courses in which members of dominant groups are told that racism is everywhere and that they themselves perpetuate it have resulted in increased hostility towards marginalized groups. It is bad psychology to tell people who do not believe that they are racist, who may be even actively despise racism, that there is nothing they can do to stop themselves from being racist and then ask them to help you. It is even less helpful to tell them that their own good intentions are proof of their latent racism. Worst of all is to set up double blinds and like telling everyone that if they notice race, it is because they are racist. But if they don't notice race, it's because their privilege affords them the luxury of not, or of not noticing race, which is racist. Such an oppressive focus on race combined with the critique of liberal universalism and individuality is not likely to end well, neither for minority groups nor for social co cohesion more broadly. Such attitudes tear at the fabric that holds contemporary societies together. That is incredible clarity from two scholars who are not even Christians. It is sad that the church is buying into a worldly understanding of race. It is pathetic that liberal scholars and an atheist like James Lindsay have more discernment than pastors and theologians. As Christians, we are commanded to be on guard against these destructive and empty philosophies. Colossians 2.8 See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Tragically, that's not the case. Instead of discerning and casting out this worldly ideology, many Christians accept it and promote it. Contemporary Christianity's Concerning contemporary Christianity's newfound embrace of critical theory, John MacArthur says this, Evangelicals always late to the party are enthusiastically jumping on another cultural bandwagon just as its wheels are about to come off. As an analytical tool, CRT has no more use than a wrecking ball. It can demolish core social structures and leave society itself in ruins, but it cannot clean up the mess, much less build anything worthwhile. So if racism is not what the world says it is, if racism is not critical race theory or what woke Christianity says it is, what is racism? What does the Bible say 
about the nature of racism. Well, the first thing that we need to understand in regards to coming to a biblical understanding of racism is this. All humans are created in God's image. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock, over all the earth and everything that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Human beings have dignity and worth and value not because of the color of their skin or lack of color of skin. They have dignity and they have worth and they have value because human beings alone are made in God's image. This is the reason why it's wrong to hurt someone. This is the reason why it's wrong to curse people. This is the, the biblical rationale, Genesis 9, 6. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Why? Why is it wrong to murder? For God made man in his own image. James 3, 8 through 9, no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With our tongue, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Why is it wrong to hurt people? They're made in the image of God. Why is it wrong to kill people? They're made in the image of God. Why is it wrong to speak bad about other people? Because they are image bearers of God. That's why. So the first thing that we need to understand from a biblical perspective is all people everywhere, regardless of ethnicity, has inherent dignity, inherent value, because they are image bearers of God. The second thing that we need to understand as biblical Christians is that all human beings descend from Adam and Eve. Genesis 2.20, we, we read that Eve is, the, is, is called the mother of all living. In Acts 17.26, God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. So the first thing we need to understand in regards to a biblical understanding of race is this. Everyone bears God's image. The second thing we need to understand is that all of us come from Adam and Eve. The third thing that we need to understand, and this is critical, is that there is no such thing as race. If everyone is an image bearer of God, and if every person descends from Adam and Eve, then you must come to the conclusion that there are no such things as race in humanity. There's ethnicity, different culture, different regions that have different looking people, but there are not different races, this kind of human and that kind of human. Race and consequential racism does not find its origin in biblical theology or in the Christian worldview. Categorizing humans by different races is rooted not in scripture, but in evolution. Charles Darwin and the theory of evolution arguably are more responsible than anything in the popularizing of racism. Darwin, you'll recall, argued that humans come from apes. And if that is your theory of human origin, then it's logical to conclude that differing ethnicities came from different kinds of apes. Darwin's influential book is The Origin of the Species. But did you know the subtitle of that book, The Origin of the Species? It is this, The Preservation of Favored, favored Races in the Struggle for Life. And while this book deals primarily with animals, Darwin would write another book where he would use the same theory of race among animals, this kind of dog, that kind of dog, border collie, you know, all the different kinds of animals. He would use that same kind of logic and apply it to humans, and it's called the descent of man. And because people came to believe that we're descended from apes, they believed that some ethnic groups hadn't evolved as much as others. They came to believe that some peoples came from lesser apes. So blacks, they're strong, but they're kind of stupid. So they came from gorillas. Asians are really smart, and so are orangutans. But whites, we're the strongest, we're the smartest. We come from the chimpanzee. And you think I'm making a joke. I'm not making a joke. That, is the, that was the logical conclusion. 
But this is not accurate scientifically. Race is not a conclusion from science. It is a social construct. According to the Human Genome Project, the human genome sequence is 99.9 the same in all people. This is what the Human Genome Project says. DNA studies do not indicate that separate classifiable subspecies, races, exist within modern humans. According to the Human Genome Project, there is no such thing as race. While individual genes for physical traits, such as skin and hair color, can be identified between individuals, no consistent patterns of genes across the human genome exist to distinguish race from one another. What that tells us is you get past the color of someone's skin, the color of their hair, which we learn is defined by the geography and the adaptation of the culture, the climate that you're in, why your, your skin colors the way it does or your hair is the way it is. Once you get past those externals on the inside, all the same. 99.9 the same. What this means is that race, in fact, is a social construct. There is no such thing. Evolution has led people to classify human beings as different races. But that does not come from a Christian worldview, and that does not come from the Bible. And as Christians, we cannot embrace categories of race. Vodi Bakum says race is arbitrary. Racial classifications are not real classifications. There is but one race. There is virtually no genetic difference between a black and a white man. We have the same original parents. We are of multiple ethnicities, but one race. The racial distinctions between us are arbitrarily distinctions based on certain features we have, but not on a real difference. So the first thing we need to understand from the biblical perspective is that every human being bears God's image. Every human being has inherent dignity and worth because he's an image bearer of God, he or she, and, er and there is no such thing as race. Next, we need to understand the reality of depravity. All humans, the Bible tells us, are broken. All of us have a sin nature, and all of us act on that sin nature. Romans 3, 9 through 10. Through 12. Listen to, listen to this. Considering all this discussion that we're having about race this morning, consider this. Are Jews better off? Paul says, no, not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are under sin. As it is written, no one is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Not only are we united in dignity because we are image bearers of God, we're united in depravity because all of us are born with a sin nature and all of us act on our sin. All of us. All of us lie. All of us steal. All of us lust. All of us hate other people. Those, that's all sin. We all do it. We're broken. The implications for racism is clear. Because humanity is fundamentally broken and because each person is totally depraved, we're born with a sin nature and we act on our sin nature, which means racism is in fact alive and well. But it's not what critical race theory says it is, this system of power oppressing individuals. What it is is individuals hating other people, treating other people differently, being prejudiced out of expressing the evil of their own hearts. And why is that? Because humans have wicked hearts. Our country has made great strides in overcoming culturally accepted racism. Think about it. 200 years ago in this country, you could own another person. The United States considered indigenous people, Native Americans, to be savages and forcefully relocated them to the reservation. It's not like Native Americans were like, oh, hey, um, this is premier land. Yeah, why don't you ship me out to the desert where there's nothing? What a great deal. No. Racism. Andrew Jackson, racist. After the Civil War, racism continued. It's not like it ended with the Civil War. We had legalized discrimination, the law of the land. And that has, that has set people of color back. I mean, we, we cannot deny that. We, we can't. We cannot say that a people group did, who was not permitted to have education for a couple hundred years. They were messed, they, they, they were messed over. They had racial policies set against them, and they're just, they're just fine. No, it, it did 
disadvantaged them. It did disadvantage them. After the Civil War, during Reconstruction, during segregation, you had literal lynchings and murders that are racially driven. But that's not the case anymore, at least in regards to legality. Like, like if someone's black and you fire them, they can sue you and they're going to win because that's discrimination. There are laws protecting minorities now. Great strides have been made. We had a black president. Programs have been instilled in attempts to make right what was wrong. Programs like affirmative action and free health care for Native Americans. And you can disagree philosophically with that. And we can argue whether or not those things have been effective. But the point remains that there have been attempts to right past wrongs. And yet, with all of those strides, there will still be racism. Racism will never go away as long as human beings are alive because humans are depraved. Now, now that we've laid all of that foundation, specifically, chapter and verse, what does the Bible say about the sin of racism? James 2, verse 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Partiality, this is a word that means favoritism, Respect of persons, partiality. It's treating people differently based on artificial categories like race. Jesus showed no partiality, no favoritism. He treated the Jews no better than the non-Jews. He was born in poverty, he lived in poverty, yet he ministered to the poor and the rich alike. Though he was ethnically Jewish, that didn't stop him from intentionally ministering in Samaria to a woman. The Samaritans hated the Jews, the Jews hated the Samaritans, but Jesus went anyway. Jesus being the Lord of glory was very much in line with God the Father, and we learn that God the Father has no partiality. Romans 2, 9-11, there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and the Greek, for God shows no partiality. So you do wrong, you're going to be punished, is what the Bible says. It doesn't matter your skin color. You do right, you'll be rewarded. It doesn't matter your skin color. Why? Because God shows no favoritism. He shows no partiality. Then notice in verse 2, James gives us an illustration. First is the command, don't be partial. Here's the illustration. If a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing comes in, if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or you sit at my feet. So here's the situation. You're at church and you're gathered together with God's people. And two guys walk in. One is rich. He's wearing a ring, fancy clothing. You say, hey, there, there, there's, there's not much room in here, which higher ground, there's always room. But let's just pretend there's no, there's no seats in here. Hey, why don't you come sit right here? Take my seat. The other guy is wearing shabby clothing, hair's a mess, he stinks. And you say, hey, why, there's no room here. Well, you can sit in the back on the floor if you want. Partiality. You've shown preference. You're judging someone not on who they are, but how they look, how they smell. And it would be a mistake to limit the application of James 2, 1 through 9, as simply being about rich or poor. And the reason why I say that is because James writes to an audience who's all poor, all of them. And that's why he uses that illustration. James' point is not some sort of um, Marxist class warfare here. That, that's not the point. The, the people he's writing to, they're all poor. So he uses an example that's going to resonate with them. Hey, if you being poor have a rich man coming in and you treat him better than you treat the rest, the, the rest of each other because all of you are poor, that's wrong. That's the point. And so we can conclude then it's the same with ethnicity. We cannot treat a certain people group a certain way and another people group another way. But what happens when we do? Look at verse four. If you are partial, if you treat other people different ways, Based on externals, look at verse 4. Have you not made distinguish, distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? When you do that, when you look at an, a, an ethnic group and you view them a different way, that is evil, James says. 
That is sinister. You are, you are setting yourself up as a judge and your thoughts are evil. Verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law of Scripture, you will love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So as we've seen, biblically speaking, the sin of racism is the sin of partiality. So one of the things that we're going to learn over the next couple of weeks is that we cannot use terms and worldly definitions and descriptions and seek to wed it with biblical Christianity like our woke brethren are doing. The Bible speaks to racism, and we've seen that this morning. The Bible speaks to reconciliation, and, and we'll see that next week. The Bible speaks to justice, and we're going to consider that in a couple of weeks. In, close, in closing this morning, very briefly, I want you to consider Someone several ways that the Bible celebrates ethnicity. The Bible celebrates ethnicity with interracial marriage. Did you know this? There, in, in the past, have been Christians who argued against interracial marriage. But according to Numbers 12, 1 through 10, we read that Moses married a Cushite. Moses, being a Jew, marries a black woman. Does the Bible condone that? Does God get all mad about that? No, God doesn't. But Moses' sister, Miriam, does. And do you know what God does in response to Miriam's bigotry? He gives her leprosy. He makes her skin white. John Piper says this pertinent point. He says, God says not a critical word against Moses for marrying a black Cushite woman. But when Miriam criticizes God's chosen leader for this marriage, God strikes her skin with white leprosy. If you ever thought that black was a biblical symbol for uncleanliness, be careful how you use such an idea. A white uncleanliness could come upon you. So here's Miriam who expresses racism to Moses for marrying a black woman. So God turns her skin sickly white and gives her a disease. Another way that the Bible celebrates ethnicity is in the church itself. And we're not going to spend much time here because this really is going to be the content of next week's message. But Paul actually says that in, in Galatians 3.8, to me, though I'm the least of saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plain mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to rulers and authorities in heavenly places. What, what Paul is saying is there is a mystery. Here's the mystery. Jew and Gentile, are when they become Christians, become one. In the early church, the Jews... We're trying to tell non-Jews, if you want to be a real believer in God, if you want to be a real Christian, you got to be circumcised. you got to obey our calendar. you got to do all of these Jewish things. What was mysterious to them, what they couldn't understand, is that when they became Christians, they became equals with the Gentiles. The Gentiles were just as much the people of God as they were. A final way that the Bible celebrates ethnicity is the future picture that we have in heaven. Revelation 5, 9 through 10. They sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. The heavenly picture is that before the throne of God, you have a an innumerable multitude of people from every tribe, every nation, every people, every language, and all of them are expressing adoration and worship to God. We've now arrived at a biblical understanding of ethnicity. We've seen how wrong critical race theory is in its understanding of racism. We've seen how hollow critical race theory's cheap imitation of woke Christianity is. Off-brand CRT from woke Christian leaders does nothing but undermine the teaching of Scripture.
The Bible, as we've seen this morning, doesn't have a category for races because there is no such thing. Race is a human construct intended to subject some people, groups, as inferior to others. The Bible has no category for that kind of thinking. Instead, the Bible tells us that every person is made in God's image and therefore every person has undeniable dignity. Harming others and cursing others is wrong for this reason. Racism, biblically speaking, is the sin, partiality, preferring some people above others, treating people differently for external reasons like wealth or ethnicity. The reason we cannot be partial is rooted in God's character. He himself is not partial. That's all clear. What's also clear is that racism is a present reality. It will never be eradicated as long as human beings are living. Every generation of humanity fully acts on its depravity. People express their partiality and hatred for others because of skin and culture. And, if, and some of you in here this morning, I'm sure, have experienced this partiality because of the color of your skin. The problem of racism, the sin of partiality, is affirmed by Scripture. But what is the solution? How does God fix racism? How does God reconcile ethnicities? How does God overcome someone's hatred for another person because of the color of their skin? What is the church's responsibility in that process? Well, we'll look to Scripture next week to answer those questions. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning relieved in your sufficient word that we don't have to embrace worldly ideologies for trying to understand racism. Your word makes clear that as human beings, all of us are made in your image, that all of us being image bearers have dignity and worth, that it's wrong to treat people with partiality because of that. So God, help us to be a people who are sensitive to people's experiences, but also firm in our conviction that the Bible speaks to this issue and that you in the sufficient word have told us that racism isn't systemic oppression of victims, but it is in fact individual acts of partiality. So Father, help us to be a people who understand that the answer to racism is in the gospel itself is in changed hearts. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.